And our next speaker is Simon Danish. Hello, everyone. Um, I will be talking about Marky today. Um, the primary library I've written in Julia. Um, oops. Okay. <laughs> Let's see. Yeah. Um, I study cognitive science in Germany. I worked quite a long time at the Julia MIT lab, and now I'm the Julia expert at Next Journal. And you can already see Next Journal here. It's like a cloud platform for notebooks, basically. And it has a presentation mode, which is kind of experimental. So I hope it works well for me today. <laughs> Um, well, that's a good start. Okay, what will I be talking about today? Um, how does Maki work? I want to give a few introductions, a li little bit technical, a little bit um, very hands-on approach. How, how would you interact with things? How would you write recipes? And how do the backends actually work of Marky? Because it has several backends. And then I, after each section, I um, talk a bit about what is the state of Marky. So after each sec section, I'm having a what's missing and what's there I will present. Um, I want to thank quite a few people, and I'm really happy about this because that means Marky is becoming more and more an open source project that many people work on, which makes it more, a lot more likely to succeed. So Anshul has been rocking documentations and everything, very, a lot of small issues he has been fixing. He's been very active in the last month. Pietro, um, very early on, wrote Stats Marky, a pretty nice add-on to Marky. Shashi and Travis made pretty much the web backend for Marky, um, the basic for it um, work. Chris Foster did quite a few things for the OpenGL shaders. And of course, the MIT Julia Lab, which uh, sponsored quite a lot of work, especially in the early days. And now Next Journal also still lets me work on Marky and other Julia packages. So they are supporting this as well and lots of others. When I publish the slides, you will see there are lots of people, actually, in the contributions. So what's this Marky? Um, at its basics, uh, it's very simple. It's made of, of some few primitives. Historically, it's eight primitives. So you see here, it's like an image kind of type, a mesh scatter, which just scatters meshes around, um, but that's more of an optimization. Um, you have a line type, a line segment type, a scatter type, um, a volume type, and the cat, of course. And what I already said, this can be cut down to more basic types. So actually, you really just need these four types. Ah, here we go. The cat is a primitive. The cat is a primitive, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's substantial. <laughs> yeah, the, this is the WebGL backend. It's also very um, new. Um, but it works. <laughs> so this is more what we have. So you have the scatter type here, the line type, and the volume type, and the mesh type is gone, but we see it here. That's what the mesh type can do. So you can have a texture on it with images. You can have it in 2D with wireframes. You can have it, uh, make a surface plot out of it or you can just color the edges of the mesh. And same goes for the line primitive. You can do quite a lot of with it. Um, and if you compose it together, you can make like contour plots 
or wireframes and things like that. And what's missing here is, yeah, as I said, historically I have these eight primitives because of the OpenGL backend had performant implementations for it, but it could be cut down to four types that a backend needs to implement. Um, I, it should be a lot easier to overload specific higher level combination types, like the surface type, for example. I have an optimization for that in the OpenGL backend, and it should be very easy to just say, okay, I intercept here, I make this faster. Or for the SVG backend in Cairo, it should be a lot easier to just say, okay, I know how to print a whole string. I don't want to do it via the scatter because that's how it's implemented right now. Text is just a scatter of like glyphs, basically, or characters. So the backends, we currently have Cairo Marquee, which is the uh, backend you can use to generate SVG or PDF plots. Then we have um, WebGL Marquee for um, fast drawing in the web. It's 80% feature complete. There's still a few things missing I will mention later, but you will follow it through the talk because all, most all drawings are made with WebGL. And then there's GLMarkey, which is like the first and primarily backend, which has full feature completeness and is high performance, but only works on a desktop machine where you have a GPU. And as you can see, it's very easy to um, switch the back end. You can actually also re-display. So this line primitives, that's the scene from before I already showed you. And after you switch the back end, it will actually like re-render it. And here you will also see slight differences, and that's simply because the WebGL back end still has a very simple line type, which isn't rendered as nicely as the, in the Cairo backend, but in principle, it should, should look identical. <laughs> so um, what's missing? Ironically, um, in Cairo Marquee, we need better text support, even though that Cairo itself has better text support. That's what I mentioned in like the refactor I need for the backends and primitives. It would be nice to have interactivity, although that's not a very high up on the list because the Cairo backend is very slow, so interactivity probably won't be as fun. And yeah, PDF is not yet implemented, but should be just a matter of a couple of lines to implement that. And 3D mesh support is actually also pretty simple with Cairo Marquee. Uh, it, it just needs to be done. And the WebGL, um, yeah, we need a bit more stability. And the drawing performance is pretty great for the WebGL backend, but um, creating the scenes and communicating with the browser is pretty slow. So a lot of time is spent serializing stuff to JSON, and there are quite a lot of things we can optimize here. And the proper line shader I already mentioned, and not everything is interactive yet, but most things are. You will see during the talk that you can actually interact with it. And you can, can't pick in the WebGL backend, so in, in the OpenGL backend you can actually like see what's under the mouse, uh, what kind of plot there is, and select that. But that's, that will come soon. And how do you put these things together, these primitives? Well, in Marky you have a complete scene graph, and a scene graph means that every scene has a transformation, so you can scale it, rotate it, and translate it. And every scene can have children which have their parents' transformation applied and then have their own transformation. And what you can do with that, for example, you can create the universe here. Um, you cr can create the sun, the earth, and the moon. And if you see it here, the sun uh, the earth actually is a child of the sun, and the moon is a child of the earth. And this way, I hope this executes nicely. Yes. 
And this way you only need to rotate the sun and the earth to actually rotate the whole thing. And this is not physically correct, but <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to make it too complicated. Um, but that's the power of the scene graph, that you can just like link these transformations. And that's what makes Marky also more like a drawing framework if you're, if you're not using the high-level plotting. And layouting, whoa. <laughs> um, works similarly. You can, each scene has like a space on your um, screen and you can actually initialize it with a certain space, so you can say, okay, this scene starts with a zero, zero, and 300 in width rect angle, and then you can have one that starts a bit to the right, and this is all dynamic, so you can actually resize these um, and place them wherever you want. That's, and that's the basics for how layouting works, and how, for example, VBox and HBox is implemented. That's a very simple way to lay out things. You just say, okay, I want these vertical next to each other, or I want these horizontally next to each other. And in Marky, you can also say, well, they shouldn't always like be equally spaced, but I want like custom sizes for it. And this way, you can create fairly complicated layouts here. And still have it interactive. <laughs> um, so VBox and HBox is currently the main way to lay out things in Marquee, but as you can see, it's very flexible. We can put any API on top of it. We just need to do, figure out what we actually want and what we need to automate. And if you look at the axis here, it doesn't work really well with not having as much screen space. It doesn't really adapt to that, so we need better axis support to have really nice looking layouted plots. But that's on the way. I'm, that's what I'm currently actively working on. And Julius just came suddenly out of nowhere and ported a layout constraint solver to Julia, which he made a prototype to lay out axes so that they start at the same point and you can like, in the layout you can say what needs to overlap, what needs to be aligned and things like that and you, then you can make very complicated layouts and I'm working together with him to get this into shipped with Marky with the next version. Um, So these are the ways you can interact with scenes and the scene graph and transform stuff. But you can also put primitives together in a recipe. Um, how that works, the very simplest way is you have your own type and then you overload the signature. The actual type that you need to overload is a bit complicated, so I have this function plot here that returns the correct type to overload for your own type. And then you get this plot object passed and you can simply call plot functions on that. And with that, you just add new primitives to this plot. And in that way, you can fairly easily create new plotting types. For example, I made this one for a molecular simulation type, and since Marky has a focus on interactivity, this recipe allows you to step through the simulation and actually update the, um, the graphics. Yeah, so the molecules wiggle a bit, and let's just pretend this is a whole simulation. Of course, in this simple example, it isn't. Um, what's missing? That's, uh, there's quite a bit missing for the rep recipes, but I think I figured out the design space for them. Um, so for example, you can't add multiple scenes to this plot type in the recipe. That means you can't lay out them next to each other or stuff like that. But I think I figured out how to do this very nicely in the API. Then the 
it, the recipe system grew a bit naturally, so it's not that consistent. It needs a bit of a polish. And the note handling is a bit annoying. So this interactivity that you just saw works with having everything as a signal in this recipe, and that gets, gets a bit complicated. But Pietro and I figured out um, much nicer ways how you can choose between how you want to write your recipe, if you want to actually care about interactivity or not. And that makes th things simpler. And then it's planned to ingest plot recipes to just because there are like hundreds of plots recipe existing and it would be really sad to just like leave them on the road. So um, I'm working on getting them integrated with Marky. And I think once we have that nicely working and documented, um, Marky will be in a very solid place to actually, yeah, have much of the same functionality as plots and above that have even more than that because of all the performance and interactivity. So um, Pietro wrote Statsmarki as a wrote, and he very bravely did that already without the recipe system being fully there. So he already made quite a cool API to make statistical plots. And Michael also made a Marky theme package because everything is actually themable in Marky. You just need to write a package for it. <laughs> um, so you can have plots that look more like um, the GG plots. So what's missing here? As you can see, there are no legends in there. Um, I will later show legends are actually implemented, but they're not nicely integrated yet. It's kind of a funny feature for me because I'm like, yeah, this is super simple. It's kind of boring. I will just do that when I'm bored, but I'm never bored. So <laughs> um, <laughs> legends are still not there, even though it would probably just take a couple of hours to integrate them. Um, we, it would be lovely to have better unit support to have like text be um, screen resolution independent and things like that, or your marker size that it's either in the coordinates of your data or that it's in the coordinates of your screen coordinates. That's very important to make um, nice visualizations. I don't have like block scales and things like that implemented. It's very easy to add, but the access needs to respect it, so I need to um, improve the access support, which, I, as I already said, is what I'm actively working on right now. So I, I'm positive we will have that soon. And yeah, Plots has a lot of convenient function, um, which we should all port. It's probably each of them is a like three liner, but it needs to be done <laughs> to get the same kind of um, ease of use. So um, the interaction in Marky works via Observable. It's a package written by Shashi. Um, I call it signal usually. I made the somewhat mistake to alias it in Marky, so I call it note. It, it's, it's just a type alias to observable because I wanted to keep the option open to switch it out with another type or maybe extend it beyond what's observable is offering. Well, now it's called note. So in Marky, any attribute or any data, you can just simply wrap it in a note and pass it to the plotting function. And what you can then do is you can pass these observables around. And whenever you update them, the plot will update. Um, and when I said everything is an observable, um, it really is. Because even if you don't use them, like in this plot here, This is a weird error, but it's not fatal, <laughs> luckily. Um, then you can still update um, the attributes because internally they are still observables. They will all get into, turned into observables. So you can directly update them. And Marky also 
offers scene events, which are pretty much the events of the display. So you can have an observable for the mouse position or your mouse clicks or your keyboard input. And you can just take those and whenever something like the mouse position change, you can build up some interactive um, program to update your plot. So that makes it very easy to, to work with like implement um, picking or something like that. And the cool thing is um, Shashi and Pietro did this interact package where you have sliders and widgets. And it's also, even though that it's web-based, they also use observables. Um, so you get these nice sliders and it, Marky doesn't care where the observables come from. So it works nicely together, especially with the WebGL backend. So you can have this So you can make interactive kind of graphics like that. Um, it it works, works fairly well. Um, this also would work in iJulia or Atom in the plot pane. So it basically works everywhere where, where you need it. Um, I also made a small example how you can um, use the mouse input to interact with your plot. So you can just like, hmm. <laughs> well, of course. Well, there's one cross. Usually you can make more than them. Um, yeah, what's missing here is Interact has an API to define widgets and sliders, and Marky has one, and we want to unify it so that you can just swap it out and have like a program that you wrote with Interact and Marky work on the desktop in OpenGL exactly the same as it works in the web. And yeah, the picking and complex interactions also don't completely work yet with the WebGL backend. I have a few showcases, so Oceanigens <laughs> um, is a great simulation framework for the ocean. Actually, I wanted to get it to work um, interactively, but um, somehow there was a mismatch with the CUDA version because the, the simulation actually runs on the GPU. But luckily, I had an external notebook where it already worked. <laughs> preserved, so um, that's where I hope Marky will get used much more for uh, big simulations that run on the GPU, because you could actually directly have the data on the GPU and visualize it there. Um, I did that also ages ago for, for a particle simulation that ran on the GPU. Uh, it used, uh, used OpenCL, which doesn't work in Julia 1.0 anymore, so only a video. <laughs> but I hope, um, I've seen a lot of simulation packages here at JuliaCon already, so I hope there will be more and more use cases like that. Mm. If you don't believe me, so this is like the volume plot in WebGL in Atom. Here, so this works just in the plot pane with all the interaction you need. Um, and then David P. Sanders gave me a pretty nice example. Um, this needs picking, so that's why I had to switch to the desktop. So this is OpenGL Marky now um, that runs directly on the GPU. And you can make cute little um, interactive apps like that. And I also promised to show you that Legends and a more plots-like API actually already worked, just needs to be integrated. 
Um, Davi <laughs> made a prototype of that. Um, Marky actually supports many of the interact widgets um, natively in OpenGL, so you just that's exactly the same example as before, but with um, Marky, 100% without interact, and it works pretty similarly. It's just faster. <laughs> So you even have like a color picker in which it's like that. And finally, Moritz Schauer gave me a very nice demo of his stochastic simulation. Um, I don't know exactly what it's doing, but it looks pretty cool. <laughs> and you can interact with it, like change the parameters of the simulation. You can see it looks different when I move the slider. <laughs> Um, sadly, I can't really explain exactly what's going on, but I thought it's a very nice use case of writing interactive dashboards or apps with Marky to look at simulations. Yes. So that's pretty much it from my side. I am publishing the slides directly so you can um, execute it yourself online with Next Journal. So you can just go to this um, URL, nextjournal slash astonish slash markytalk, and you can run all the code and all the visualizations and play with it. Um, yeah, that's the URL. I will tweet it, so I think everyone will see it but it's published now, and yes, any questions? Uh, do you have thoughts on how you would save something like a 3D scene into a format that someone could look at without having to run mach -E on their end? I mean, you could always take a picture and send them a PNG, but that doesn't really capture the what you would want to do. Is there some way to you know, take the WebGL part and turn that into something self-contained? Yes, so the plan is to make the output of the web framework as self-contained as possible so that you can send it around. Um, and I'm, I started doing that with WebIO, but WebIO is not completely tailored to that, so I experimented with my own framework a bit. And yeah, we'll see how it goes. But I, it, it's possible, should be possible, and will be possible. <laughs> Thank you, Simon. Thank you. All right. Thank you.